Hello, everybody, and welcome to this all-new episode of the Fairfax Sports Report. I'm your host, Monica Moore, and we have a great program for you tonight. Of course, we will be talking about the budget cuts that are being contemplated in Northern Virginia. I know that's a topic that's on everyone's mind right now. And to help me go through that, I'm delighted to be joined by some of the best sports writers from around the region. Paul Frommel from the Fairfax Times, BJ Kubaroulis, a contributor to the Washington Post, and Dan Sousa, editor of Viva Loudon. But first of all, let's thank the folks that help make our program possible. First of all, our good friends at CCI Screen Printing for all of your screen printing needs. Also, special thanks to Craig Sturbutzel for some of the photos that you see throughout this program. Don't forget that you can get copies of this program at www.pressboxvideo.com. And you can check out our website at www.fairfaxsportsnetwork.com and our Video Vault feature. Become a fan of the Fairfax Sports Network on our Facebook page. And don't forget to send us any news, story ideas, suggestions, or comments that you have to our email address. Well, as always, let's start off with some news and notes. First of all, congratulations to Terry Toll, who is the new director of student activities over at Westfield, replacing Francis Dahl, who announced that he was stepping down earlier this school year. Of course, Toll has been very successful with the field hockey program over at Westfield, winning two district championships and one region championship. More big news going on over at Westfield. They've announced that they're installing a new turf field, which they hope to have in place for the spring sports season. We have lots of coaching news to announce tonight. First of all, we reported a couple of weeks ago that Edison football coach Vaughn Lewis had announced that he was stepping down. Edison has announced that his replacement will be Anthony Parker. Of course, Parker well known throughout the national district and the region. He's coached over at Falls Church for the past eight years. Also, big news for the Colonials, they have announced that Ken Kincaid will be their new coach for the 2010 season. Of course, Kincaid coached over at Thomas Jefferson from 1997 to 2000. And finally, congratulations to Barry Hall, who is the new head coach over at Mount Vernon for their football program. Okay, well, one last thing that I certainly want to mention, I talked about this a little bit last week, but it certainly deserves mention again, and that's that Madison High School is inducting a new class into their Athletes Hall of Fame on January 30th at 6 p.m. at the Westwood Country Club. Some of the people being inducted, of course, J.J. Hollenbeck and B.T. Good, former baseball players, and Hollenbeck is now on the baseball coaching staff over at Madison, and Kate Gartner, who was instrumental in getting the Madison girls basketball program off the ground and finally that 1989 state championship girls tennis team and Amanda York Bailey as well okay well as usual we will begin the program with the Loudon report so I'll turn it over to Paul and Dan to let you know everything that's been going on in Loudon thanks Monica I'm Paul from up from the Fairfax County Times Dan Sousa editor of VivaLoudon.com let's just jump right into this Loudon report Dan and Andy Hill, very, very successful head coach over at Parkview. He's stepping down. Yeah, we like to start with a little football news each week, right? Last week was Mike Burnett from Broad Run. Kind of a shocking development there with back-to-back -back state championships. Now Andy Hill, who's uh, been at the school for five years and, and, and made the playoffs four times, uh, went ahead. He doesn't have another job lined up yet, but went ahead and made the uh, unusual step of resigning first and, and saying that he was looking for different opportunities. So my, uh, Mike Burnett over at Broad Run stepping down, going to possibly, probably start up the program over at Tuscaroosa, the new high school is Andy Hill thinking broad run? Is he thinking Spartans? I, mean, I think I definitely it's something he has to look at hard. He, he has a couple of options. He is from the Midwest. He wouldn't mind getting back to the Midwest and coaching again. He also said that if he stayed in Virginia, he'd like to move up to a AAA school. Of course, broad run in two years will be promoted to AAA because of increasing enrollment. So that would be a good fit for him. So I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, Andy Hill, if he does stay in Loudoun, to become the next broad run coach. Very successful football coaches. Uh, Switching around here in Loudoun County, so it should be a, a pretty exciting 2010 football year. We see where these coaches land. But let's stay with basketball. It is the winter season. Big game in the Liberty District, the Stonebridge Bulldogs beating the McLean Highlanders. Let's jump right into the highlights. You see here, um, just for Stonebridge, it all comes down to Richie Berry, who had a fantastic game for the Bulldogs. And, Dan, these Stone, this Stonebridge team is uh, firing all cylinders. They or are. was uh, on Friday night. They, they were, and, and Barry had a had a 
a, a usual night in the first half. He had 18 points in that first half and ended up with 24. So uh, usually Nick Brown leads him in scoring. And they, uh, you know what? They led from start to finish. They could never quite pull away. Give McLean credit. They hung tough. Taking a look at some of these highlights, you see a, a very balanced effort by the Stonebridge Bulldogs. Richie Berry with 24 points, Nick Brown with 14, Ryan Loudermilk with 9. On the other end for the Highlanders, Gordon Rogo led the team with 17 points. But again, just Stonebridge all the way here and in the fourth quarter, just, they just really pulled away with that 10-point victory. And they were able to use their pressure. I mean, Stonebridge wants to have an up-tempo game, and McLean was trying to match it, and I think that didn't really help McLean because it's tough to run with Stonebridge right now. The Highlanders, a, a taller team, a, a team better for, for the patient offense, and of course Stonebridge, the run-and-gun team. And as you mentioned, McLean tried to stay with them in that run-and-gun kind of offense, but the turnovers you see there, and, and Stonebridge was able to pull away to take a look at, at more of the highlights here. And you see McLean trying to run there, actually in that play, and they're able to, to finish in that one. But it, it, the lack of height did not hurt Stonebridge in this game. Now, they lost last night to Marshall, and that did hurt them in that loss. The Stonebridge in the always competitive Liberty District, and these Bulldogs actually have a pretty good record uh, this year. You did mention a recent loss, but, but they're doing very well. Yeah, 9-5 school record, and they've never, they're 5-2 in the Liberty. That's still their best start ever in the Liberty. 70-60 to 60 over the McLean Highlanders. Richie Berry had a game-high 24 points. Gordon Rogo... 17 points for the Highlanders and um, I had a chance to talk with Sonny Green and Richie Berry after the game to talk about the season Stonebridge, ha Stonebridge has had so far. Thanks Matt, a 70 to 60 win for the Stonebridge Bulldogs here with Sonny Green and Richie Berry. Coach, a, a big win takes you 5-1 and one in the Liberty District. How big is that for this team? Well, it's very important, especially being on the road. Um, right now we're on a, um, we have I think it's six out of our next seven games are going to be on the road. So we, we have to take care of every game one at a time. And, and um, McLean always gives us a tough game. And to come here and get a win, was, it was pretty important for us. Talk about Richie and Nick Brown. Both had a great games for you guys. Yeah, this year, offensively, they've done a great job. They, um, we put the ball in their hands a lot. And they take care of the ball. They get everybody involved. And, and they're able to create shots for themselves. I don't have to call a lot of set plays to get them shots. They have the ability to put the ball on the floor and get themselves shots and their, and their teammates shots. And, and they did a good job of that again tonight. Coach Dan mentioned you talk about that 70-point barrier to get over that for your offense to be successful. You guys were able to hit 70 points. Talk, 70 points. talk a little about that. Yeah, that's our goal. Every game we try to play at least in the 70s plus because whenever we can get in the 70s, we, um, we feel like we should be able to get enough stops to win the game. And for the most part, we've, we've done that this year. And tonight we were able to, with our defensive pressure at times, speed them up a little bit and make them play into our hands. But they did a good job too. I, I think McLean's a young team, and, and they did a good job at times handling our pressure, which is something we have to continue to work on. But um, I think that defensively we did a good job making them play at a, um, overall at the pace we wanted to play. Richie, 18 points in the first half, uh, 24 overall. You just mentioned to me your points you scored doesn't matter as long as you get the win, but talk about the game you had. Well, in the first half I was really feeling it. I was on fire, but in the second half I knew that in order for us to win the team, for us to win the game, I'd have to play more with my team. So the points, they don't, they don't really matter to me if we lose, but I'll do whatever it takes for, us, for our team to win. And I Rich, I wanted to ask you, I mean, last year you guys only had uh, eight wins. Now you have nine wins this season. What do you think the difference is uh, this year? Why, why the success this year? Well, I think this year we have more team camaraderie, and we're bringing the intensity to the defensive end as well, the offensive end. And Coach is, is uh, doing a great job preparing us for these upcoming games, so that's why I think why we're having better success. Definitely. And Sonny, talk about that. I mean, you, you've had teams that have had different talent, maybe more talent than this team. No offense, no offense. Yeah. But I think you, this is probably one of your better basketball teams altogether. What, what can you say about that, Sonny? Well, the key to this team is that I think that for a team to be successful, the one thing is that for your, your best players to play consistently, and I think we get that um, pretty much night in, night out. And I think the other thing is for your role players to um, contribute and play their roles. And we, we get um, two of our players to um, average around 40 points a game for us. And... Our role players, they don't complain. They continue to find ways to get them, get them shots and give them the ball. And they know that um, Richie and Nick is going to do the same in return. So um, I think that this team just does a great job playing as a team. And, and I think that that speaks volumes for, for the kids I've had the opportunity to coach this year. Coach, speaking of your depth, you had a freshman, uh, Jimmy Page, with five points in the fourth quarter. I mean, talk about that depth. 
Well, you know, we have um, some kids. One, the one fortunate thing I've had, I've never had since I've been here, is I've had two consecutive JV teams move up that had winning records. And since I've been at Stonebridge, it's usually been maybe one, sometimes none of them have. So this year we have, we have depth where we have players that can step in at any given time. And some of the players that didn't play tonight have stepped in, in other games and they've contributed. So we, we have nice depth and we have kids I can count on in different situations that, again, can come in and play roles, rather be defensively or, or knocking down a shot. And um, Jimmy Page, he, he's broken the school record already as a freshman with 15 rebounds in a game. So, so I'm, I think that as he continues to mature, he's going to be a heck of a player. All right, Sonny Green and Richie Berry, the Stonebridge Bulldogs, go to 5-1 and one in the Liberty District with a 70-60 to 60 win over McLean. Dan, uh, we both had an opportunity to talk with them, and we mentioned it briefly. You asked the question, what is it about this Stonebridge team? Because they do have such a complete team this year. I think it is, and they're playing just good team basketball. And, and, and the Liberty, you know, it's not like there's a team that's way out there in front of you. You can play good team basketball night in and night out. you got a chance in that district. And... You know, it's a football school, and they're trying to carve a, a niche out there to make it a, a basketball school as well. Let's jump into the Dulles District standings. Obviously, Stonebridge plays in the Liberty District and AAA, but let's take a look at the Dulles District. Pot Falls, Broad Run, but also Parkview. Yeah, you know, we talk a lot about Potomac Falls and Broad Run, but you got to look at Parkview. There's only one loss in the district, and, um, you know, they have something to say here. So I, I think it's really, at this point, obviously you see that it's a three-team race. By the time uh, this show's show airs on Wednesday night, Parkview could have a, a much bigger uh, say in the district because they play Potomac Falls. Tip-off was at 7.30. Obviously, we don't have the result of that game, but I mean, it could be a big win for Parkview. Yeah, I mean, if they go on the road, they're at, they're at Potomac Falls tonight. Uh, if they would win there, that would really shake up the district. So it would be very interesting to see. Let's take a look at the Cedar Run district standings real quick over in the Northwest region. You see Loudoun Valley, you see Heritage right there at the bottom. We mentioned it last week. But Loudoun Valley, a, a, above 500 record at 8-6. and six. Yeah, They are, and, 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 and they just played uh, Heritage. So they're kind of, you know, they're, they're learning their way around the Cedar Run. It's a tougher district, and they're doing very well against the non-district opponents right now. Let's take a look at, at the, the score from that Loudoun Valley and Heritage game. Loudoun Valley winning handedly 74 to 40. That was a shocker there. I mean, that final score, 33 point, uh, 34 points, that, that's a, that was a shocker to me. And see uh, some of the scores. Four players in double digits for the Vikings in that nice win over Heritage in the Cedar Run District, beating a, a neighborhood rival. Yeah, and you see all the rebounds there. Uh, Valley's a very tall team. I've been p uh, petitioning to get them to be renamed the Valley of the Giants. <laughs> it's not going through yet, but uh, Keep on it's fighting. surprising. Heritage had just beaten uh, Parkview in a non-district game mm -hmm. and cooled Parkview off, so I thought, well, this is going to be a very competitive game, but uh, the Valley came out and, and controlled it. With that, let's take a look at Viva Loudon's boys basketball rankings for this week this is as of january 17th potomac falls right up top broad run right with them at 14 and one yeah and, and until those two teams meet again i think that i foresee that's going to be one and two probably and and stonebridge is trying to uh you know we thought maybe they could move up here but like we said they had lost to marshall uh which was a little bit of a surprise that mm -hmm. was on the road yeah um so right now it's potomac falls potomac falls is ranked number two in the state right now in double a Potomac Falls having a great season, and they are number one in VivaLoudon.com's boys' basketball rankings. Let's jump over to girls' basketball. We can take a look at the Dulles District standings in a second for girls' basketball, but it's Freedom, it's Loudoun County. That's kind of what we expected. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, these two teams both won state championships last year, Freedom in Division Three, Loudoun County in Division Four. In the history of basketball in Loudoun County, there had never been a basketball state championship since the school started playing, and then in the same year, they collect two, two teams from the same division. A lot of teams right there in the middle, Pot Falls, Broad Run, Park View. What else jumps out at you about these standings? Well, Potomac Falls is definitely uh, a viable third team in the district. Broad Run is struggling right now a little bit. Uh, they're in the middle of the pack, and then some of the other schools uh, are, are down a little bit further. But Potomac Falls has the potential to get into a tournament and maybe upset a Loudoun County or a Freedom. Uh, they've got some pretty good players. But it is all Freedom and Loudoun County atop the district standings. And hey, guess what? These two teams play each other on January 22nd. Mark your calendars. Freedom, Loudoun County. Last season, uh, uh, Loudoun County was 25-5 Division IV state title. Freedom, 28-2 and 2 
Division three straight title, and Freedom's won five straight matchups against Loudoun County. They have. They, last year they dominated, and they, they won in the regular season. They won in the district tournament. And last year, being two different divisions, they didn't have to play each other in the regional and the states. But this year it changes. Freedom was promoted up to Division four because their enrollment's increasing. So now these two teams are going to have to play each other in the district tournament. They're going to have to play each other in the regionals, possibly, maybe into states. So a good year 2009 was for Freedom over Loudoun County. Just in the last four meetings between these two teams, one of them, the Dulles District Finals, Freedom won 61 to 57. Let's jump right into the probable starters and look at who's who and who, how they're going to match Let's up. Here's Freedom. It. You see Kelsey Buchanan. You see Deanna Scott Buchanan with 16.3 points per game. Deanna Scott, 16.8, and look at Buchanan, 12.1 rebounds per game. Well, she's a, she is the, a true center, a true post player. She has a scholarship to play at the University of Rhode Island, Division I player, and she's just a joy to watch. It's been fun to, to cover over the years. She's a senior now. And Deanna Scott, or Dee Dee Scott, is, is a slasher or a scorer. He gets out there and, run, and runs the break. But the other thing to look at is, is Jessica Scores, their point guard, mm -hmm. who started out as a freshman at Freedom and then went the private school route for a couple of years. She's back for her senior year, so it gives Freedom a, a big three. And what about the Raiders? Let's take a look at Loudoun County. It's all Brittany Betts, 19.3 points per game. She leads the team in scoring. She does, and then talking to Coach Kevin Reed, I said something about her being one of the best pure shooters in the in the area, and he said, are you kidding? She's one of the best pure shooters in the state. <laughs> I mean, this girl can shoot lights out, but I also would look at Kendra Holmes there. Uh, she is probably the biggest player for Loudoun County, yet she gets out there, and you see she's averaging 3.8 assists per game. She sometimes runs the offense and has to handle the pressure and take the ball up the court. And Jenna Strange, it should be mentioned there, Jenna Strange is just a sophomore, and mm. she's already won three state titles. She's won back-to-back -back state titles as a volleyball player and last year as a basketball player. Wow, so mark your calendars January 22nd, the Freedom Eagles against the Loudoun County I can't Raiders. Wait for that game. Let's jump over to the Cedar Run District real quick in girls basketball. Stonewall Jackson 10 and 2, one of the best teams in the state. But look at the the Vikings right there, 9 and 5 overall, 3 and run, 3 and 1, excuse me, in the district. Yeah, and, and they, Kayla Sweet's playing really well for Loudoun Valley, and, and they're in that coveted second spot. It's only a, a five-team district, which is about as small as you're going to get. Mm -hmm. The district decided, not so nicely, that the fifth-place team would not make the postseason tournament. Mm. So if you finish fifth in the Cedar Run, you don't even get a chance to move on to region. So it's going to be a four-team tournament, and you don't want to face Stonewall Jackson in the first round. Absolutely not. Uh, and Stonewall Jackson's so good, they're going to win that semifinal matchup. So basically, mm -hmm. that means Loudoun Valley is one win away from making regions. They either stay second or third, get into that tournament, they win that one game, and they're going to make the Northwest Regional Tournament. Let's take a look at the Vikings' win over Heritage, 56 to 43, sweet with 24 points. Odin with 17 points for the Vikings. Yeah, and it was important for them to win this, to, to stay in that second spot. And it should be noted that for Heritage, uh, Nicole Sterling, who's their top player, she's been out a month now. She wasn't able to play in this game. She's hoping to come back when they play Stonewall in a week. But uh, Heritage will be a much different team if they get Sterling back in the lineup. Let's take a look at Viva Loudon's girls basketball rankings. Freedom, no surprise, at number one. Loudon County right there at number two. Yeah, but for Freedom, we have to say, um, update the record, they're 11-3 and three now. now but it's no, uh, no shame that they lost to Riverdale Baptist yesterday. Riverdale Baptist is one of the top girls teams in the state metro area mm -hmm. in the country probably uh, and that's the type of competition that freedom is playing right now they schedule riverdale baptist they play stonewall jackson twice as, as a non-district opponent they're playing georgetown visitation they really up their schedule because they want to get back and they'd like to win a second straight state championship freedom eagles actually saw them play triple a westfield in the finals of the bulldog bash holiday tournament so they're playing top opponents you're watching the Loudon Report, Paul Frummel, Dan Sousa, editor of VivaLoudon.com here on the Fairfax Sports Report. Let's jump into Dulles District Wrestling. Freedom beating Potomac Falls 56-18, to and Dan, this is a big win for the Eagles and a yes. big loss for the Panthers. I know you like this because you're a South Riding type <laughs> of guy down there, right? Uh, yeah, Freedom, we've been talking about last week's show, if you saw it, you know, that they're the top program this year, but of course they had to beat Potomac Falls to prove it. Potomac Falls had not lost in four plus seasons in the Dulles District, and Freedom went out in 56 to 18. I think, I think a lot of people thought this might be closer, but in fairness to Potomac Falls, they had three starters that are injured, and so they're, they're not wrestling at full strength right now. Let's take a look at the results for the higher weight classes in that dual meet. You see Constantino winning at 171. 
we'll just we'll just keep it right there. You see Hosi, and there's Constantino. Excuse me, Freda, uh, 189 winning. So a lot of big wins. Obviously, if the score of 56 to 18, you're gonna have a lot of your kids winning. Yeah, and they're gonna go undefeated in this this season. They've won four tournaments already. Um, you know, they're having just a, a dream season right now. And, and Potomac Falls is still a very good uh, program. They've sort of been the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it was pretty big for Freedom to go ahead and, and win this match. And also make sure to know that the dual wrestling and tournament wrestling. Two different things. Uh, completely different animals. So it doesn't mean Potomac Falls has no chance at the Dulles District Tournament. But Freedom also hosted a, a dual meet, uh, eight, eight mats. Eight mats. There were mats for everywhere. Main gym, auxiliary gym, the cafeteria. And the Eagles coming in second in those Freedom duels. See, take a look at the top four. Millbrook, one of the best wrestling programs in the area. Freedom, our Robert E. Lee from the northern region, and then Heritage from the northwest region. Loudoun County's Heritage from the northwest region. So those are the top four. And this was a little bit of payback. The week before, Millbrook had hosted their own tournament, and Freedom went uh, out to Winchester and won that tournament. It's the first time Millbrook's ever been beaten on their home mats at their own tournament. So this weekend, Millbrook, a little bit of payback, they went south riding and they defeated Freedom at their tournament. Let's take a look at the top wrestlers at each weight class by VivaLoudon.com. And a couple of Freedom guys on there, as you expect, but the Renzi from Broad Run. Yep. Vince DiRenzo, he's, yeah, he's sorry. 135, an incredible story. He, he won 50 matches last year as a junior. He is the school's all-time victory uh, leader and he's about he needs about 15 more wins which he'll probably get this year he would become Loudoun County's all-time victories leader. Let's take a look at the the higher weight classes for the Dulles District wrestling ratings and again more freedom guys. You on see the, the list. Eagles you see their strength having so many wrestlers that uh, are the top wrestler in their weight class. Let's jump over to some Dulles District swimming Dan how about that? We always gotta do swimming. We always gotta jump right to the pool and <laughs> Briar Woods sweeping Potomac Falls and you see the first district loss for Potomac Falls in four point four and a half years and uh, a, a theme I'm seeing Dan in this Loudon report is Freedom, Briarwoods, the two youngsters in the Dulles district they're having some big wins. Yeah, they opened in 2005 and I think it takes some programs that couple years to really get going to full strength and uh, Potomac Falls has been so good in so many sports you look at cross country in the, in the fall, you look at the wrestling and the swimming. And so, yeah, they're starting to take a little bit of a hit. But in fairness to Potomac Falls, they're still right up there. Mm. But this was a pretty historic win with the Briarwoods you know, girls handing them a, a loss. The Briarwoods girls, they are really strong. And some of our weight, uh, some of our categories for the top times, they had the top four girls in some of the events. Let's take a look at the standings for the Dallas District in boys swimming broad run right on top there, 5-0 and in the district in dual meets. Yeah, they will defend their district title. I don't, I don't see anybody knocking them off. They're having a great season. And how big was that win for the Dulles district, for the Briar Woods girls in the Dulles district? They are 4-0 and undefeated in the Dullis district. Potomac Falls right there at 4-1. and Well, and you know it's a big meeting. You know, I was looking over the results earlier today, and they're just, almost every event had top times for the girls for, that, for the year. So, you know, they really went at it. A lot of times in duels, Teams don't necessarily care or they play around a little bit, but this was a serious event. All right, Dan, we're in the home stretch here of this Loudon Report on the Fairfax Sports Network. Let's jump into some gymnastics here real quick. The top scores, and, and there's some late breaking news in these top scores. Yeah, broad run, number three on the chart there. Uh, they're going to jump ahead of uh, Loudon Valley, the AAA school. They, they posted a 136. Point three in the meet at Potomac Falls last night, which is a great score for Broad Run. It puts them sort of in the driver's seat. They have uh, Kimmy and Drea Ewing, two sisters, who are uh, two of the top three all-around uh, scorers right now in the county. And uh, they look like they could be the district champion this year. But Freedom, Potomac Falls, and Lowndes County, it's going to be a really exciting gymnastics meet and uh, something I'm looking forward to covering. <laughs> All right, so a little bit later in this show, we're going to talk about Fairfax County and the proposed budget cuts. But Loudoun County has some proposed budget cuts as well. Remember, they, Loudoun County already has a $100 fee. That could increase to $200 or $300 per athlete per sport. Look at some of these extreme measures. All freshman sports and junior varsity lacrosse would be cut. Um, all assistant athletic directors would be eliminated and part-time assistant athletic trainers would be cut. Um, Dan, well, I'm telling you more about this because this, <laughs> this is a big deal. This is all proposed. It's not obviously not right. set in stone, but... And I've got, a, I've got a son in high school, so you're starting to make my wallet hurt mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, basically, the school district has presented their ideal budget, and it doesn't affect the athletics right now. But at the same time, the Board of Supervisors had asked the school district, 
to submit a budget if we don't increase your funding, if you keep it the same as last year. In that case, those are those proposed cuts. They're in that alternative budget. And of course, you know, I mean, these are the type of proposals that will get people up in arms and they, you know, I mean, touching freshman sports, especially freshman football would be uh, huge. But yeah, raising that fee, I mean, they were able to get the fee in at $100 per athlete per sport, 200, 300, it would be, um, I think it would be a tough sell to maybe to keep increasing it. But uh, there's a budget shortfall and mm -hmm. even from the state, you know, they're not looking, they're looking at less money coming in from Richmond. So uh, somehow they got to balance the books. So every county in this area is facing those difficult decisions. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the, the situation in Loudoun County. But Dan, that's it for the Loudoun Report. Great job. I'm Paul Frommel, Dan Sousa, editor of VivaLoudoun.com. Monica, that was, a, that was a lot of Loudoun for you. <laughs> Well, thanks, guys. We'll segue back into the northern region now. BJ Kubarulis had the opportunity to catch up with a couple of members from the Oakton swim team in the Players' Lounge. Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Players' Lounge. I'm BJ Kubarulis. Well, we have two special guests inside the lounge with me here tonight. We're switching things up. We go from the hardwood hoops, and we dive into the pool with two of the best swimmers in the northern region. Right here to my immediate left is Caitlin Palowitz and of course her teammate Brad Phillips, both of the Oakton Cougars. Now, uh, these two swimmers here are considered two of the best in the region, and that's because they're coming off a team regional championship from last year, uh, and they're also coming off of individual uh, state titles. Let's, talk, start, let's start with you, Brad. You're a senior co-captain. Your team won the regional title last year. Uh, and then you won some individual titles. Let's run through them real quick. The 200-yard freestyle, you won that medal, and then you were a runner-up in the 500. Uh, talk me through that event as you were reaching for that, that wall in the 200. What was going through your mind? You know, the 200 free was probably one of the most exciting races I've ever been a part of. Um, reaching for the wall, you know, I was just trying to get my hand on the wall first. Those last 10 yards, those were a dogfight, me and a couple of my good friends, so I was Really fortunate to have won that. Um, probably couldn't have done it without my teammates on the side of the pool, just screaming their heads off. You know, I can hear them before the race, so that's a little more motivation. And ended up getting some nice 20 points for the team. Right, and you guys are now returning. You've got that target on your back. I want to talk to you about that because uh, you came in as a sophomore, really had a big impact. Now you're a junior, you've got a state championship under your belt. Uh, last year, uh, girls 200 yard individual medley champion, and you were also the runner-up and the 100 butterfly. Uh, walk me through what it was like to win that, uh, that medley title. Um, well, it was definitely really exciting since I was only a sophomore, but um, it was really important for me to do well and also score points for the team and also try to get a best time. And then in the 100 fly, um, I got second place, which is just as good as first for me. And I also did the best time, so it was really good. Yeah, and, and you come in now, and you kind of expectations have to be pretty big for you as a junior. How do you kind of handle that coming in as a junior? How do you stay level-headed? Um, well, I try not to put too much pressure on myself and, you know, just, like, swim, like, well, you know, and also just do stuff for the team, like relays and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and both of these uh, swimmers joining me in the Players' Lounge here today in this special pool edition. Uh, they both swim at Curl Burke, which is a very popular uh, a, a swim club in the area for Coach Jeff King. Uh, many of you might remember, who, those of you who uh, follow this show inside the Writers' Lounge, we had Paul Tenorio, who is a beat writer for The Post, who swam with some of you guys um, during the offseason, and he cut a lot of weight. He also has a blog at reachforthewall.com, which is part of Washington Post. I'm sure you guys all follow that stuff. But speaking of results, and this is a very results-driven um, kind of sport. Uh, Brad, expectations this year, the results, people kind of looking for you as the, as the, as the captain uh, for this squad. Um, how do you stay level-headed in, in trying to take this team back to that regional title? Well, as far as goals for next year, I'd say overall a state championship for the team would be my number one goal. It's been the team's goal since I came here freshman year, so we've been working towards that. and. We, you know, we have some really tough competition this year, so it should be a fun meet. Um, as far as expectations, you know, the, the target on the back, that's, we kind of enjoy that, you know, having everyone bring their A game, you know, having our meets circled on their schedule, so kind of think that's pretty fun. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's a lot of hard work. A lot of people don't realize that swimming isn't just something you just dive in the pool and, and just race your best friend to the, to the wall. It's, it, it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of early mornings. I want to ask you about that because 
Um, you know, with Curl Burke, it can be very demanding, and then you have high school and that kind of stuff. Um, how do you balance your time and then also just being a teenager? Um, well, we do practice every day after school, so it is kind of tough, and we get home around dinner time, so you have like a lot of homework, you know, so it is really, like, you really have to focus and keep your, like, get your work, you know, done, and I don't know, just keep yourself organized so you can get all your work done and keep the grades and be able to swim on the high school swim, swim team and do well in club too. Uh, speaking of staying focused, let's get focused on some of your teammates, guys. I know you're both very super itching to, to talk about some of these, these kids that you swim with. Let's start with you, Brad, uh, as the captain. Walk me through some of these guys and what they mean to the team. Uh, freshman Philip Hugh is really having an impact early on. KJ Park and Chris McGaw, uh, McGaw. Can you talk about some of those guys? All right, well, starting with Philip, he's a freshman. So we lost one of our key swimmers last year, Michael Halleck, a backstroker. And Philip coming in certainly uh, lessens the impact of losing Michael. He's a really quick backstroker sprint. Um, he helps in our two medley relay a lot. He gets some individual points for us as well. Hoping to get some of those out of him for the championship meets. KJ Park, he's my age. We've been together for four years. You know, we've been training together a lot. We're pretty good friends too. Um, he's a breaststroker, so we could also use a lot of points out of him out of states. Chris McGaw, a sophomore last year, he stepped up really big come championship meets. Uh, he was a freshman with pretty much no experience, so we just threw him into those relays and he came out pretty good. So. I'm really fortunate to have teammates like that to All help right. carry Kate, the team. I'm going to put you on the spot. we got about 30 <laughs> seconds. Dylan Staniszewski, yeah. Megan Perry, Kristen Callahan, Leanne Heyer. With that squad as a whole, what can you guys accomplish? Um, well, Dylan is definitely a really strong freestyler, so we can um, she can help in the freestyle relay. And then Megan and Kristen are also really strong breaststrokers, so in the medley. And then Leanne as well, a backstroker um, in the relay. All right, you heard it from the Oakton Cougars. These top swimmers want to thank you, Caitlin Palowitz and Brad Phillips, returning state champs from last year. We'll continue to track their progress. I want to thank you guys for joining me inside the Players' Lounge in this special pool edition. Uh, for the Players' Lounge, I'm BJ Kubaroulis. Until next week. Oakton having a great season so far with their swim and dive team. Let's talk a little bit about some Concord District basketball because the Tuesday night Verizon Fios game of the week this week was a big battle between Chantilly and Westfield. The Chargers getting the best of the Bulldogs. Let's take a look at how this all went down. You see their nice move by Howerton driving and then Savage with a nice spin move getting the bucket. Yeah, Monica, this was uh, all Chantilly the entire game. They held Westfield to just nine points in the first half. You see more of Keithon Savage with the, with the layup. It was, and then John Manning in the middle battling Elkano, the sophomore from Westfield. Both doing a great job, but Manning obviously the more experienced big man. But there you saw Zach Elkano for the Bulldogs coming up with the big block. Nice drive there by Gibson, but Manning there to swat the ball away. Then on the other end, Adam Friday with the big bucket. Yeah, Friday, Howerton, Manning, all in the middle, just big bodies doing a great job for Chantilly, a nice bit of passing there. And again, it was just all Chantilly. You see Manning actually taking a charge, shows the young, uh, shows the experience for the junior. Chantilly definitely looking very polished in these highlights. Great ball movement, outside shooting, inside shooting, great defense. Chantilly displaying everything, and then Manning with the big dunk, nothing like that to get the crowd up on their feet. Yeah, and Elcano, the young uh, sophomore for Westwood, actually fouled out in this game, and that allowed Manning to get some more points on the board. Manning uh, led, the, led the Chargers in the game, and really just all Chantilly. You see Manning with another block. Manning has just improved year after year, and Keith on Savage is having a great year for the Chargers, someone they can go to, but so many different players. Dane Howard there scoring. Here you see Adam Friday. Lots of different players on the roster that can make an impact. Here's Gadsden for, for Westfield, just a fantastic finish by him. But again, all Chantilly, 59 to 32 over the Bulldogs. All right, well, let's segue into some Patriot District basketball. T.C. Williams squaring off against Montrose Christian. This is a matchup that happens year after year. Last week, B.J. and the guys talked about Terrence Ross and his decision to reopen his college recruitment. But you see there Montrose Christian getting the best of the Titans, four different players for Montrose Christian in double digits. Yeah, and Billy Rowland right there with 12 points for the Titans. Ryan Yates with five. Montrose Christian, an elite program. Uh, T.C. Williams, a great program in the northern region, but you can see that just outmatched there by Montrose Christian. 
We've been talking a lot about Concord District basketball, so let's talk about Chantilly's matchup with Centerville, which happened before the Westfield Chantilly game that you just saw the highlights from. Now, Centerville, very strong team this year. Warren Denny having a huge year. He is Mr. Double Double mm -hmm. for the Wildcats. You can see probably why uh, Chantilly came out so strong against Westfield because the, the loss to Centerville, but Senator, we, we've seen Warren Denny a couple of times. We know how good he is and just an amazing, amazing uh, year for Warren Denny so far. And Centerville doing a great job in, in the Concord District. They've been you know, towards the bottom of the district for the last couple of years, but now they're, they're coming on strong. Okay, and then last week we previewed a game that we were really excited about, and that was the Hayfield-Mount Vernon matchup. This was the Mark Your Calendars game that we really wanted to highlight for you. Hayfield getting the best of Mount Vernon. You see Chad Kennedy there with the 25 points. Skylar Jones still nursing that ankle injury he suffered against Chantilly, but still had a very big game for Mount Vernon. Yeah, 14 points in the second half, and that's a big win for Hayfield, the best team in the northern region uh, I think by far right now and, and coming up with the big victory uh, for Hayfield. Okay well let's talk a little bit now about some girls basketball. A little bit of an upset happening in the northern region. Oakton squaring off against Robinson. Robinson getting the four point victory and the big difference Paul for Robinson was the height advantage that they had. Bridget Cooter there you see 13 rebounds had a sensational game. They have three different players that all have that height advantage. Oakton had a really hard time counteracting that. Yeah, and this is a huge win for the Robinson Rams. Uh, just helps them out. It's a marquee victory that I mentioned that gives them the opportunity to get that momentum as we get more deep, in, deeper into district play. Anytime you beat Oakton, one of the top teams in the northern region for years and years and years, it's going to build that momentum. And right now, Robinson must be flying high. Another team that is flying high is Edison. We talked a lot about them last week. You have to talk about them a little bit more. People think that Mount Vernon and Edison are the top two teams in the National District. Edison, they're coming up with a big win over Mount Vernon. Maisha Goodwin has been so strong all year. She just seems to get better and better, even though she was outstanding last season. Yeah, 27 points, eight rebounds, five steals. Just a great job by Maisha Goodwin in the 14-point victory for the Eagles. Ruth Shirley, you see eight points, 10 rebounds for her. For Mountain Vernon, Tracy King, 18 points, eight rebounds. Uh, that's some, some nice talent on the floor when these two teams play. And sticking with girls basketball, Paul, I understand you got a chance to profile a player for the Fairfax basketball team, Lauren Burford, who has been outstanding for the Rebels. Yeah, Lauren Burford, a player, one of the top players in this area, um, she went to St. John's College High School in Northwest D.C. She went there for the first two years of her basketball career. Loved it there, she said. Had, had so much fun. Just take a look at the Fairfax girls basketball stats real quick. Right now they are 7-7. Seven and seven. They lost yesterday. They defeated Woodson and Stonebridge. Had tough losses to Madison and, and Robinson. Lauren Burford right now on, on the season. 234 points, 100 plus rebounds. She's, she's going to Villanova. Last season she was 23 and she had 23.6 points per game. Sorry, all region, all district. But uh, last year was her first year at Fairfax High School. High school. Went to St. John's, was a, a role player, six points per game. She decided that the, that the Northwest DC commute just wasn't really good for her. It was over 30 miles just to get to school. And mind you, that's in traffic on the Beltway. It's, you know, two hours, two and a half hours, three hours just to get to school. And then coming back on game night, she'd get home about 11 o'clock. And I talked to her dad and he said, you know, it's books and basketball. That's it. You know, if she wanted to go to maybe a homecoming football game, if she wanted to hang out with friends from school, that's a big task for her. She loved it there, but finally decided, you know what? It's not all about basketball. She was already getting good college looks from her time at St. John's and in the AAU uh, Fairfax Stars. So she decided that should be in order. That will fall into place. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer to Fairfax, the school she would have gone to if she didn't uh, attend St. John's. And she was automatically just brought, brought that Fairfax program back. The year before Lauren Burford came to Fairfax, they had one win under Marcus Conti his first year. He's now a third-year head coach. Just one win, and Burford actually went and scouted that team to see, you know, is this going to be a fit, a, 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 the right fit for me? And she saw something there, even though this team only had one win. 
They wound up 6-16 six, six and 16 last year. A big step up because this Fairfax girls basketball program had one win, two win, one win. I mean, that's how they were for the last four or five years. So they come up, they get 16 wins. And Burford, she was asked to play um, all, all around there. She's six foot two, and she was asked to play point guard. She played every single position on the court, and that helped hone all of her skills. And she actually became a better player for transferring to Fairfax High School. We mentioned in November she signed with Villanova, so that's all said and done. And she said, I made the right choice to go to St. John's, and then I made the right choice, choice to transfer back to Fairfax. So she's happy with er how everything has turned out. Right now, the Fairfax Rebels, seven wins, already beat last season's win mark. So she's got some nice players around her, and it's a, it's a nice success story for someone in this northern region. Well, she does have some nice players around her, but when you get a player like Lauren Burford, players get to practice against talent like that. They, they rise up to her level a bit. That's a huge thing for a team. And so Fairfax and Lauren Burford, you know, having you know, some, some success now, that's, which is, is really good for the Rebels. But we talked a little bit about the Oakton Swimming and Diving Program. Now let's talk a little bit about your defending state champions, the Robinson Swim and Dive Team, and in particular, Corey Bowersox. You see what he did there as a freshman. He's undefeated so far this season. Yeah, Monica, I also had a chance to, to profile Bauer Sox. And just as you mentioned, as a freshman, Concord District, Northern Region, uh, won the state title in, in the one meter dive and this is a kid that's such a talented diver he he practiced almost 20 hours a week just at diving um, obviously he has a uh, he, he he has eastern region uh, all, all these different titles and uh, you know he's he's one one diver that you have to look out for um, talked about maybe maybe possibly Olympics already he's just a, young, a young kid but he's doing so well he said you know I'm, I'm not really focused on that right now. That's only the select few make it, but just right now is just enjoying diving and trying to get better every week. And then last week we talked a little bit about Langley and the success that they're having. So we wanted to follow up because we previewed the big meet against McLean, Langley squaring off against a Liberty District rival there, getting the big win. And you see they were missing two of their top girls, Abby Spears, the freshman who's made such an impact, and then Jamie Caddis still coming up with the big win. A great matchup in the 200 IM. People really looking forward to that one. Chuck Caddis squaring off against Charlie Putnam. Char Chuck Caddis getting the win in this one for Langley. All right, Paul, well, we talked about the Loudon budget mm -hmm. cuts. I know you have been doing a lot of coverage of the Fairfax County budget cuts because what's being contemplated right now is pretty serious. Mm -hmm. Lots of different programs are going to be affected. So tell us what are the big things that are on the table right now in Fairfax County? All right, well this was the budget that uh, Superintendent Jack Dale uh, proposed to the school board and just taking a look at what could possibly be cut. This is just a proposal. It's nowhere near being finalized, but the following could be eliminated. Freshman sports, all freshmen, so that, that's football, that's volleyball, that's boys and girls basketball, that's freshman cheerleading. Also winter cheerleading could be cut. Indoor track, obviously there'll still be outdoor track. The advisor to the drill team, and in the proposal it says that most likely means the drill team will no longer be around without an advisor and swim and dive practice will be cut by 50%. Now, there's also, uh, there's also the big thing that's being added, and we saw it in Loudoun, who's the $100 fee per athlete, per VHSL sponsored sport. So if you see someone that's it's a multi-sport, th uh, three-season athlete, that's $300. So um, just uh, right off the bat, I talked to a, a lot of different coaches. I talked to Mike Loud, the football coach over at Chantilly. Talk with Travis Hess, the head, head basketball coach, boys basketball coach over at Langley. I spoke with Jimmy Snobry at the DSA over at uh, Centerville. I also spoke with uh, um, Dave Hembach, the D athletic director over at Stonebridge because they implemented the $100 fee last year. Just trying to get an idea. I also talked with uh, the county uh, activities and athletics director, Bill Curran. Just, every, he, every, just talking to everybody, try to get an idea of what the feeling is. And right now, um, obviously not many people like this idea, Monica, just because uh, anytime you eliminate a whole program, as Bill Curran said, that's hard, that's a tough choice to make. And he said, it's a choice that has to be made because there is a budget shortfall. Obviously everybody knows the economy is, is in a tough, there's tough times right now. So you have to do something about it. Last year, 
there were no cuts made to right. athletics. There was nothing. Actually, gymnastics got their funding restored last year. So this year, they have to change something. Well, of course, everyone was talking about this last year, wondering what might happen this year. Now, it seems like it's even more serious. But let's talk a little bit more about this issue of cutting the freshman programs, because I understand a lot of people are up in arms about this. Parents are up in arms. This even parents who don't have athletes on these freshman teams are really upset that this is being contemplated and for programs like football, for instance. It's a really big deal. Yeah, and, and I, I, I was able to, to confirm that freshmen will still be able to try out if this goes through. Freshmen will still be able to try out for the junior varsity teams. And there's some freshmen, John Manning over at Chantilly comes to mind. He jumped straight to varsity. The Coyer twins over at Oakton for girls basketball, they jumped straight to varsity as freshmen. That can still happen. Just the freshman team will not exist, which means for basketball tryouts, now, now instead of you know, making cuts for freshmen then making cuts for junior varsity, you know, I talked with Travis Hess, I mentioned, he said probably about 40 freshmen tried out for the freshman team. 25, uh, 25 kids tried out for the junior varsity team. I could be flipping those mm -hmm. around, but the basic idea is around 70 kids trying out for those two teams. Now there's just one team. A lot of kids are going to get cut. And then, uh, Hess mentioned, he has to make sure those kids, even though they got cut as freshmen, try to come back as sophomores, try to come back and get into the program. It's, it takes away a whole step in, in, in the natural order of for football and basketball and volleyball, okay, as a freshman, you come in, you get taught into the program, you get indoctrinated into the program, you learn the terminology, and then you go on and on and on. So it's tough. And Hess also mentioned that, and, and I experienced this as well coming in, playing sports in high school, is when you're a freshman and you, and you play a fall sport, you come in during the summer. So by the time school starts, your first day of high school, you already have friends that are going to the high school. You're already used to the building. It's a huge tool to get kids used to the high to, to high to high school. So that could also go as well. That's also you know a, a tough thing. Well, I want to talk a little bit about indoor track because every time I talk to indoor track coaches, the big thing that they tell me is that, I mean, this is the biggest winter sport. When you think about how many athletes compete with winter track, they don't make cuts from those teams. So freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, tons of athletes in each of these programs. And so that's going to be a huge cut because of the number of kids that are going to be affected by that. Yeah, mo most definitely. But if you look at it and something has to be cut, if something has to be cut, you look at the two sports that you can consider two season sports, cheerleading. Cheerleading, their competitive season ends in the fall, but they have two seasons, fall cheerleading and winter cheerleading. Winter cheerleading, I talked to Wes Vaughn, the head cheerleading coach over at Fairfax High School. They won a, a state title this year. He said it's for school spirit. That's what winter cheerleading is for. And now sometimes they bring in kids that play, uh, that play a, a volleyball player wants to do some cheerleading. They bring in new kids to the squad and kind of teach them to get prepared for the upcoming fall season. But really, it's for cheer cheering at basketball games. So he said, okay, that can be cut. Indoor track, you could also track, you can also consider that a two season sport, indoor, outdoor, mostly the same kids play unless you have maybe a baseball player, maybe a lacrosse player that wants to run in the winter. But I think that's, that's a, a necessary cut and a cut that doesn't hurt all that much. Okay, and then let's talk a little bit about swimming and diving because they are also facing a bit of a cut in that they could potentially lose 50% of their pool time. And so what are your thoughts about that? Well, it's something I didn't go to very in depth in my article, but cutting it by 50%, some coaches are saying, well, you know, that's just staying in shape. You know, if you cut, that's not getting better. But again, you gotta understand the elite athletes they're swimming in their club team, they're swimming Curl Burke, they're swimming their club team, that's how they're getting better. So who gets hurt is, in most of these cuts, who gets hurt is, is the, the middle of the road athletes. Say in, in a, a freshman that comes in that's not, it has a talent of a John Manning or a talent of the Coyer Twins, that he gets hurt by this. Also swimmers that, that aren't the elite, don't swim year round, just wanna swim, in the, swim for their high school, they get hurt as well. Okay, now the big question, I hate to put you on the spot, but did you get any sense about how likely these things were in relation to each other or just everything's on the table right now and they're going to make decisions as to what they're going to do at a later date. Well, we should also mention that they're, they're going to have some public hearings uh, at Jackson Middle School in Falls Church, uh, January 25th through 27th. Uh, school board's going to have people going to talk. Actually, the, I talked with Chris Coyer, the father of the Coyer twins, and, and he mentioned that uh, they're planning to put something together because they're, they're kind of upset about this. But uh, I think this is very likely. 
I think this is very, very likely. The one thing that could possibly be saved is freshman sports because there's such an uproar. But everything else, I think it's likely this is going to happen because something has to happen. And, and just looking at all, what could be cut, I mean, you, you could cut all, all varsity sports as some counties around the country are doing. You, you could cut all JV sports. This is the most reasonable cuts. Okay, well you saw there the dates and times, or at least the dates of those meetings. So if you want to make your voice known, that will be your opportunity. But now let's segue into our newest segment, the Verbally Committed segment, where BJ Kubaroulis and the guys debate some of the hottest topics going on from around the region. Hello everybody and welcome into VerballyCommitted.tv. That's right, where you go from your radio dial to your TV screen. You might recognize our voices, me, myself, Stephen Ball, and our producer, Alex Iliadis, from our show on 106.7 The Fan, uh, DC Radio. That's right, you can find us online at cbssports.com slash local slash DC slash radio, 3.30 to 5.30 on Wednesdays. It's a DMV prepcast on 106.7 The Fan. Hope you'll check out those podcasts. It's a show all about high school sports recruiting and more. Of course, you can also find us on Facebook. Go to your search bar and type in verbally committed into your search bar and we'll pop up. That's right, a DMV prep cast on 1067 The Fan. You can also email me at bcoob at yahoo.com. Well, Stephen, something that has been drawing a lot of interest was Preston Williams, a staff writer at the Washington Post, his recent article uh, about high school basketball in the district. Alex Iliadis, take us away and, uh, and get us prepped here, man, for this next battle. All right, BJ, like you said, following on Preston's story about DC coaching changes, I'm going to throw it back to you guys to talk a little bit about Theodore Roosevelt. They had a coaching change, and when the coach left, he took all five starters on the girls' team with him. Steven, you want to start this one? Well, obviously, I think this is, this is wrong. They shouldn't be allowed to lose an entire team. The entire starting five followed this coach on to, to his next school, and now Theodore Roosevelt without 120 wins in their last six years, yep. has no team. Yeah, no, you make a good point. You shouldn't be able to just pick up, dip out, go wherever you want with all five starters. What, what, right. what is That's kind of a mess. But here's what I'll say. You shouldn't be allowed to do that. But in D.C., you can. So technically, the coach didn't do anything wrong. The players who are also allowed to transfer, as you can find in Preston Williams' article at WashingtonPost.com, they're allowed to do whatever they want in D.C. They can transfer in and out of any school. Therefore, uh, a coach can recruit his players, keep them from middle school and up, build a power, and then dip out with the rest of them, Stephen. I, I think it's kind of a mess. Alex? All right, sticking with the, the coaching changes, we're going to move over to football now. Recently in the Loudoun area, two coaches, Broad Run and Parkview, both had coaching changes. They have not replaced them, but both guys left kind of unexpectedly. You want to throw this one start, BJ? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, it, you can't fault a coach for, for wanting to leave after they've accomplished quite a bit. Two of the coaching changes are Broad Run coach Mike Burnett goes to Tuscarora, which is a brand new school. He won two state titles back to back, and now he's going to start a new school. Hard to fault him there. Now, Andy Hill at Parkview may be a different story. Um, you know, Paul Tenorio at the Post has done a lot of reporting on this, and it's right. a lot of coaching changes out there. I don't know. I, I feel like Hill might, might just be kind of uh, leaving too soon. Didn't really give a, a reason for his, his resignation. Well, I think he's got a plan. I think, he, I think he's, he said he's applied to jobs all over the country. I think he kind of wants to get into college coaching a little bit on some level. But uh, definitely the broad run job is, is an attractive one to have. Yeah, but, but from Parkview to Broad Run, when you go from one part of the county to the next, after having so much success, do you think that that's an okay thing to do? Well, I think he's well within his right to do it. it, it the, pro the problem is if this becomes like college coaching, and, and we just talked about these kids' ability to follow their coach anywhere. Obviously, the Virginia teams don't have that luxury, but I think the coaches have a right to pers pursue different, uh, different avenues. Different avenues for different coaches. You're right about that. However, I, I feel like... Andy Hill might be putting the cart before the horse in terms of it seems like the well, he definitely, scuttlebutt. He definitely took a risk. He took, he took a risk. He yeah, he took a risk because the broad run job is up, and a lot of people think that that's the job he's gunning for. So I'm curious to see if that's, uh, if that's where he ends up. But if you're going to bet on anyone, you might as well bet on yourself. That's a good point. I like that. All right. You know who I bet on? Who? Alex Iliadis. Well, thanks for that, BJ. I am a good bet. But <laughs> coming back here on Verbally Committed TV for our last segment, we're going to wrap it up with talking about National Signing Day. This February 3rd, Verbally Committed, so we're all about the commitments. We're going to talk about, well, the guys are going to analyze what Signing Day really means, if anything. BJ thinks it's just a piece of paper. Steven likes to think it's these kids getting their opportunity to start things out. Steven? 
Well, I think it's a little bit more than that. I think this is these kids play hard for their team. This is their opportunity to be recognized as an individual. But we recognize them as individuals in the box score every single day. What makes this different? All right, what about an offensive lineman? That's a good point. You make a good point about O-linemen. I understand that. But on commitment day, you know, the first Wednesday of every, of every February is this big shenanigans is it's the way the I see it. It's the equivalent of high school graduation. You don't just finish something and then not celebrate it. This is their day of celebration for something they've worked hard for four years on or probably their entire lives. They deserve the recognition. I, I hear what you're saying. It's kind of like making it official. And I understand that, that they want to make an event out of it, and I get that. Here's what drives me crazy, because I do agree that they should have a celebration. What drives me crazy is when I show up to a signing day, and you got a kid sitting at a podium, and he's signing a blank piece of paper for the cameras. That's the stuff that drives me crazy, because it becomes more of a Wouldn't show make... rather than, than a true. If he was signing a scholarship, I'd feel a whole lot better about so it. So you're telling me if it was a different piece of paper, you wouldn't have an issue with it. That's ridiculous. No, if it was an actual, if it was the scholarship, and it wasn't this, this uh, promotional thing for the coaches and the family and for everybody to kind of show, it's a celebration. look, ha look it at is. us. Uh, look, if it was the scholarship and everybody was showing up to say, hey, check this kid out. He's signing the scholarship. Let's all be there for him. But no, most of this stuff has been said and done, and this is just what? A blank piece of paper. So I, I just that that's the part that drives me crazy. All right. Did I win? I don't think so. <laughs> Looks like I might. No, win. I mean I, I thought <laughs> we were out of time. But. All right, no, no. Alex, why don't you why don't you take us away, man? All right, that wraps things up here on verballycommitted.tv. I think today was two rounds to one BJ. However, one yeah. is less than two, and Stephen actually wins because he <laughs> won the third segment, which was to do with commitments. And we are verballycommitted.tv. We'll see you. Next Okay, and a very special guest on the Verbally Committed show this week, Paul Frommelt, so be sure to check that out. Before we go, we want to preview the Verizon Fios Game of the Week, Freedom at Loudoun County. We've talked a lot about that game tonight. That's going to be a great one. Once again, we want to thank the folks that help make our program possible. First of all, our good friends at CCI Screen Printing for all of your screen printing needs. Special thanks to Craig Strabutzel for those fantastic photos that you see. And don't forget, you can get copies of this program at www.pressboxvideo.com. You can check out our website, and you can also become a fan of the Fairfax Sports Network on our Facebook page. Send us any story ideas or comments that you have. And once again, thanks so much for joining us. For Paul Frommel, I'm Monica Moore, and we'll see you next week.